Hi everybody and a very warm welcome back to the painting channel. In this week's episode I want to talk to you all about watercolour paper. So let's roll the intro, let's see how we get on. Everybody and welcome back now as I said at the start it this week's episode is all about watercolor paper it's a huge subject and I didn't know the half of it until I had gone into it in more depth but over the years I've come to learn that there is so much that I need to know and some that I can probably put to one side and the knowledge of it is good but it doesn't actually affect my watercolour painting. So with that in mind, I wanted to do a little video and it was partly born out of last week's video, which was five tips on watercolour. And I've just got to say before I go any further, thank you so much for everybody who's not only watched it, but also commented on it. It's slightly different avenue for me to approach in the fact that I've done this sort of five tips and I think I'm going to do more of them in the future. The, the response has been very, very good. And it's very encouraging for me to sort of sit down and work out the format to do one or two more of these in the future. Along with, don't forget, the plein air and the artist in van and all that stuff, which I really am enjoying. Anyway, before I go into this watercolour paper, let me just say, as always, a big thank you to all my subscribers. Everybody who's just come on recently, we are heading towards the 6,000 and hopefully by the time this gets out, it will be past the 6,000. I really appreciate all the support you give me. And don't forget, if you're watching this and you've enjoyed it, give it the thumbs up at the end if you get all that way through and subscribe to the channel if you'd be so kind. And don't forget, there is a Patreon. My Patreon is really growing and it's really nice because I've got so many real-time full-length videos over there fully narrated so much for you to enjoy also a weekly live stream for just for all my patrons and a Facebook page page dedicated just for the Patreon uh, community and they uh, sort of show their work ask questions get answers and get a lot of help from me so there's so much going on and it only costs you five or ten dollars a month so it really isn't an awful lot of money for the content that you're getting so take a look at that and the links are under this and every other video that I put out there check it out if you want to climb on board and get involved you'll be so welcome great to have you there in the meantime let's start talking about watercolor paper it is a vast subject and many people sort of really don't fully understand when they look at a pad of paper really what they're looking at so i want to try and help you out by giving you and debunking a few of the problems and sort of helping you out with one or two tips to help you decide in the future what is best for you to buy and which is best for you to continue working in so without further ado let's look at some watercolor paper okay so now i don't want to start off by frightening everybody by saying that this was a large subject it is but it doesn't have to be a big big problem so let me just try and walk you through some of the considerations that you need to make when you're purchasing or starting out with watercolor and what you might want and what you might need to buy so let's start off by talking about the surfaces that you can work on now there are three basically one of them is the hot press now hot press is very very smooth it's the smoothest of all i love it because it can allow quite a bit of lift out and quite a bit of scrubbing and um it, it takes quite a bit of punishment so hot press is a very smooth paper really nice uh, to work with let's just put that to one side for a moment and let's look at the one in the middle this one forget all the dirt on the paper <laughs> uh, this one is a not surface not as in it's not hot pressed it is cold pressed and it comes up with a medium tooth paper uh, so you can get some nice dry brush effects on this and it probably has to be said that it is the most common of all the services bought by people around the world who are doing watercolor 
There are a lot of people, of course, that use the, the hot press and they use the rough, which is the last one in the series. But majority of people are buying uh, the knot or the medium sort of tooth. It's the most favoured and of course if you go into an art store somewhere in the world you'll find probably three to one pads or offerings in, in watercolour paper that will be of the knot series as opposed to any of the others. But the final one to consider is this one. It's got a little bit of abuse on this one but this is a rough surface. Now rough, as it suggests, the paper is uh, cold pressed again, um, but it's got a much stronger and heavier tooth on it, which will allow you to paint away and create much more in terms of sparkle by leaving little bits of white paper. All you're doing with, with dry brush is skipping over the valleys and just hitting the peaks created by this lovely pattern. So we're going to talk a bit more about that further on, but that really is a very quick glance at all the different types of services. I say, oh, there's only three, but there you go. You've got hot press, you've got knot, and you've got rough. Okay, everybody, now let's talk about weight of paper. And it's a very, very confusing area for an awful lot of people. I get a lot of questions from my students and from my patrons that keep asking or not quite sure what it all means. Now, there are two figures or two sets of figures on most pads and most offerings when it comes to buying a watercolor paper. And they are grams per square inch and pounds. Now, I've seen people buy two or three hundred pounds actually it's not it's grams per square inch and they end up with a very very light paper because they get confused the thing is that it's the the pounds really is the most important to you both are very readable both are important but this really the poundage of the paper tells you how thick or how strong or how absorbent the paper and the quality of the paper is you can buy watercolor paper from as for as little as 90 pounds not in money but 90 pounds in weight it really is not much bigger or better than cartridge paper it really doesn't bode well for the watercolorist not in my personal opinion and i've got to say that everything i express in this video is just my opinion okay so you know it's it's just really what i feel and what i've learned over the years now the thing is also that the next stage up is 140 pounds again like not paper it is the most uh, uh, the most widely made uh, poundage of watercolor paper that you'll find Everybody who starts out almost certainly will start out on 140 pounds weight paper. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, I will tell you a few things and suggestions to that further in. But 140 pounds is for me the very basic level that I'd want to start at. I would then go and look at 200, 230 pounds up to 300 pounds and 300 pounds is very very heavy it's like a small board lovely it's a bit like a piece of cardboard but it's fantastic and it is great to work with but enough of that for now so we are looking at the poundage and i wouldn't recommend you go anything lighter than 140 pounds in weight and certainly if you can buy many papers that are 200 or 230 these pads are not that expensive compared to a pad of 140 pounds there's not an awful lot in that so i would certainly consider spending a couple more pounds and buying something that is like that another uh, offering from hannah mule is this one which a lot of my students use it is a 200 pound weight paper you can see i use it also it's a knot surface which allows you um, a nice bit of texture. Okay, so that pretty much covers the weight of paper. Now then, the other question that comes up is um, the, the business of wood pulp, cotton, or a combination. And it's got to be said that the cheaper end of the market, if you buy a pad like these ones, or this one, 
almost certainly they're going to be wood pulp maybe if you're lucky and you pay a little bit more maybe i'm not i can't actually find the stats on this one um but they could be a 50 50. now i know hannah Muir do have wood pulp they use a 50 50 cotton and wood and they use their top end of their range is cotton now it has to be said that the difference between the two is quite substantial in terms of how the paper will react how it will receive its sizing how it will react with color and and the vibrancy that you get between wood pulp and cotton now when you're starting out it's got to be said that cotton pads are really expensive you can pay two to three times the amount of on a pad i mean a pad of this for instance is around about 11 12 pounds for this size the equivalent pad in a cotton pad would cost you closer to 40 pounds um, or somewhere around that sort of mark and it isn't very very cheap but wood pulp is certainly i mean the quality that you get on some of these pads really really nice and when you're starting out you do not need to have to save up all your money to buy a pad of pure cotton uh, watercolor paper but it has to be said and I, i'm bringing it into this equation on this video because um cotton is stronger and it is most certainly stronger the fibers are stronger the ability to not warp is better than wood pulp and um and and the you know the surface uh, the the acceptance of sizing i believe is better with cotton allowing you to get away with an awful lot more but safe to say that some of the better brands of, of watercolor paper on their cheaper ends such as this one this one and indeed this one will allow you to have wood pulp at a reasonable price and give you a reasonable quality of paper to work on. In fact, I've got to say that most of my students at the gallery will, I supply this to them. It's a good paper all round. It's a nice weight. It's in a block. So, um, and it does give them a very, very good finished watercolor. So that's enough of that. And what I will just touch upon is the quality of some of the bigger names, some of the bigger names of papers like um Bockingford, Arsh and um Saunders Waterford, all of these sort of big, big manufacturers of mold made, uh handmade papers as it were, um, they will use in their top brands, they will use pure one hundred percent cotton. You can buy the Arsh's pad in the different uh colours, the orange, green, and I think purple. Uh, you can buy the different surfaces in different sizes and um, you will be able to get pure cotton and it's not cheap but it really is a nice paper to work on now before i depart from that you can get things like this this is a fabriano paper this is fabriano artistico the green one is the rough and the uh, pinkish one is hot pressed and they also do a blue colored one here that is the knot surface but again you know these pads are not cheap these are about 20 odd pounds a small 9 by 12 pads and um you know that's almost uh, a pound one pound 20 depending where you go per sheet so there is always this reluctance when you've got such a nice pad to keep it wrapped up never to be used because you want to learn and you think that if you use this you are not going to do well on it and therefore you're going to waste the money that's something i really do want to talk about in another video about that attitude got to, got to change that attitude anyway so back to this this is just a knot surface and a pad okay so one of the areas that people keep asking me about is how do i hold my paper down what's the best process what's the best paper to stop the buckling or cockling and it's not an easy or a straightforward answer and so i'm going to try and touch upon it now you can buy a 
piece of watercolor paper doesn't matter who the manufacturer is doesn't matter um, the quality in a sense it doesn't matter whether it's wood pulp or cotton you can buy it in several ways you can buy it as a loose leaf and you generally only find that with the larger bigger manufacturers with the higher quality to produce their uh, papers from 140 to 3 or even 600 pound and yes you can get that high um, you can uh, buy in loose sheet and some companies will cut them down for you into the required size generally so you can either get them half or quarter but the full imperial is 22 inches by 30 therefore a half imperial would be um, 22 by 15 and quarter imperial 15 by 11 which is probably the one that i use most of all but i do buy my sheets at 10 at a time it's not cheap it is quite a scary cost and then i will cut them down into the sizes that i require so that's one way of buying paper the second buy is or the second way is to buy them into a pad form now a pad can be loose leaf like this which is not unlike buying a loose leaf you can tear one out and you can paint upon it or you can leave it in here and you can paint on it and the the other thing is that uh, you can buy also spiral bound now I have had spiral bound and there are many manufacturers out there that will produce a pad with a spiral uh, hinge to it I absolutely hate them I have still got some and I tend to go along with a craft blade and cut them out and cut them into a straight shape but I so annoying and I hate spiral bound but that again is my personal opinion the other way is to buy what's called a block now you've already seen me show you uh, blocks and block colors or block pads are where they're gummed all the way round except for one area depends on the manufacturer where that area might be on this one in fabriano it's just here and the idea is that you will paint on a pad which is like i've done here you can see the painting that i've been doing turn it around so it looks correct <laughs> there you go uh, i painted on it and the idea is that it may cockle when it's wet but when it dries because of the gum around it it will make it go back flat again so that once it's dry you can then find the little area that gives put a credit card in there run it around release that piece of paper off put it to one side to do whatever you wish to do with it in this case as you can see here these paintings will be cut down and put into a mount but at the same time you are then free to carry on working on the next piece you must however make sure that before you release a paper off that it is totally dry and I've seen people take it off too prematurely and it starts to bend and warp because there's nothing retaining the edges to stop in the fibers from doing a cockle or a reverse cockle and causing you problems down the road so what else can you do to stop that happening well this is probably the easiest and before I leave a block may I suggest that if you buy one you buy two the reason I suggest two is because that when you are working on one you may have to either stop working on it and allow it to dry before you carry on or you've got to wait for the finished piece to dry before you can carry on either way it takes time if you have two pads working you can have one that is drying and one you're working on so you can, you never actually have to stop painting if you don't want to you can actually keep working on it and by having two pads so it's always a good tip is to buy two of the blocks if you're working with them i work on these when i'm out plein airing and it's a lot easier for me than taking boards full of stretch paper or anything else with me i work on blocks or i work on very heavy paper that i can merely just tape down with masking tape and carry on with okay so let's just briefly touch upon uh, sizing it's a it is a big issue because every paper out on the market by what whoever makes it approaches sizing in a very very different way now there are two types of sizing on watercolor papers there's an internal size and there is an external or surface sizing and 
the the thing is that a lot of that internal is applied once when the when the pulp or the cotton is being mixed around in all the uh, ways that they're doing it and before it is dried out the surface sizing is put on after the paper is created and it creates a surface now the surface uh, sizing as indeed the internal sizing allows the paint to move better if you try a piece of paper maybe even a piece of blotting paper you'll notice that because it doesn't have any sizing blotting paper is designed to soak in everything quick that's why we use it it's a blotting paper it picks up the pigment of whatever it's a pen ink or whatever very very quickly and it doesn't release and it doesn't go anywhere and paper that's unsized will literally you'll see that if you have papers whereby uh, you put a piece of pigment on and um, it's unsized then it will go straight into the paper very very quickly it will not move and if you get a paper with too much sizing on the surface and not enough inside uh, sizing you'll find that the paint will move very very fast and all of a sudden the pigment will start to go and stop so you get a bloom of pale pigment and you get a concentrated color of pigment and that's where there's not enough internal sizing so when it does go through the surface it just goes and gone and in the meantime some of that pigments escaped and just bloomed out into a color and these are um, pretty much sort of symptoms of cheaper produce papers um what i call student quality papers whereby you know they all papers have to have a sizing that's just aren't going to work but it's the quality and the degree of that sizing that you get will determine how well the paint will uh, respond to it now a good or well-made paper or a cotton paper uh, will have sizing to the core and it will go straight through and it will be added when it's being produced and it will have a darn fine sizing on the surface so that you get a beautiful wash you get a beautiful bloom the colors work with each other they have a lovely gradation ability and it's because everything is working perfectly if you spend the money you expect it to work well and that's what you get with quality papers it's not just the surface it's not just the poundage but it's also how well it's sized. While we're talking about sizing, if you um, are vegan, strange to come up with this when we're talking about watercolor papers, but it actually is pertinent. If you are vegan, uh, it may be a case that you do need to look at the papers you're using because 99% of all the watercolor papers out there are made with gelatin, which is animal byproduct, uh, bone and what have you, I think you'll find, and therefore may not necessarily coincide with your beliefs uh, as a vegan. But that said, there are quite a few out there, Canson, Heritage, uh, I think Bockingford, and one or two others are producing papers with a plant size starch sizing, which will obviously suit you better so it's worth looking into it it's worth checking that out um, if you really don't fancy using anything animals as a vegan which i understand uh, it's worth checking that out before you carry on using the current paper that you're working with you may object to it later on but that said let us now talk about how we hold our paper okay so what i've got in front of me is three separate types of watercolor paper they're both these are um from the same company one is a loose leaf and one is a block and this is some small section of a very expensive 300 pound paper what i'm just going to simply do is just show you how uh, color can work differently or water more than color what i will do is i've got a great big mop here Let's load this full of water. I've got one sheet. Now this is what will happen to a thinner sheet of paper when you wet it. Now this is very, very cheap in a sense because it is the water is not going in. There's so much sizing on the surface that it really isn't going into the surface at all. I'm going to leave that. I'm going to put the same on this piece of 
a 300 pound weight paper almost the same saturation I'm going to leave that there and you can see that this one is just as that water is going into the surface this is a block this is where the paper is gummed down on all sides by a little bit lots of water gone on there let's just see what happens you can see here quite clearly that this is bowing up under the pressure basically when any paper gets wet its fibers are going to expand wood pulp paper tends to expand more than cotton paper another reason why the better quality is cotton and not wood pulp now there's nothing wrong with any of them and i sell my students wood pulp pads because they can't afford 30 40 pounds a pad and i'm not suggesting you do either i'm just saying that there are these other options out there and the reasons why people will spend out a lot of money on a cotton rag as opposed to a wood pulp is very evident you can see how this paper has just literally created its own little tunnel and this is barely moved uh, and i applied the same amount this of course this is a block paper and this may well have a slight uh, movement i can tap that down and you can see that there is a slight pulling up as the paper fibers are sort of getting wet and absorbing up that moisture and pulling apart and so it's got to go somewhere but it can't go everywhere this can go anywhere it likes this one cannot because it is gummed down and that's why you have to wait for these two this one to dry totally before you take it off because there's any moisture left in it it will carry on moving again and that's not what you want so hopefully that makes this little bit understandable if i try painting on this like this well you can see what's going to happen <laughs> it doesn't take a lot of working out but let's just have some fun with it while we're doing it let's just mix up a little color and let's just put that on and you can see where this is going to lead because the paint is just going to go down the sides now i've got no control over that and you know i wouldn't use it for that reason let's just come back in let's just put a bit on here and there is much greater control over that because it's not bowed up and it's not taped down i love this paper because if i do want to go out i don't have to like stretch it or do anything it is good enough to do that on its own and again if i use the same idea on here it too will not go anywhere it will not bubble up it will not cockle or buckle this is an absolute <laughs> well it's an absolute nightmare so <laughs> with that one clearly out the ballpark you can turn around and say why did i buy that pad well the thing is that you have an answer to this if you wanted to let's just put these all to one side just for a moment or two let's just come back to that cheaper pad which i had just now where did i put it there we are it's called aquafine now this is not a dig at um data rowling for aquafine the paper is what it is and i could give you tons of companies out there that are creating paper just like this for people to paint on but it has got to be said that it is limited now then i'm just going to try the same thing i don't use this paper i don't know whether I, where i got it from or not but let's just put that down let's give that a big big firm half and half on like that seal it down a little bit of moisture there i didn't see that now this is what I will do with even my 300 pound paper. Those of you who watch my videos regularly will know that I will tape my paper down onto my board prior to painting on it. Sometimes I go a full width and then more just to get the aesthetic of that wider white margin. But if you are just painting for the sake of and you don't really not precious about that, then that's good enough. Now the tape is down and in theory it should act a little bit like a gummed piece of paper. So let's just try that out. This is going to cockle again. 
I'm going to put on the water in the same way as I did just now. Lots of it, maybe more, much more than you would probably normally use. But let's just see what happens to that over the next couple of minutes. As paper is worked, the more you scrub your paper, the more you can stand to damage it. It's also a thing with wood pulp over cotton. Cotton will stand that much more. Wood pulp will start giving up the surface a lot sooner than cotton. So it's another little factor to be aware of. I think with all things, when it comes down to cost economies and what you can buy, student range, artistic range, you've got to ask yourself that there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of professional watercolors and painters out there. And if it were the case that the cheaper wood pulp papers would act the same or better than cotton, then none of them would go out and spend their money on extra money on buying quality cotton papers. No different to buy student paints or artist quality paints. You know, if paints did exactly the same thing, whether they were a student range or an artist quality range, quality yeah, professional artists wouldn't go out and spend twice or three times as much money on the professional ranges. They would buy the cheaper ranges. So the professional ranges are there for a reason, but so too are the student quality ranges. They're also there for a reason. Uh, you know, you can you can go through an awful lot of paper as a painter, and um, yeah, at the end of the day, you can you can use an awful lot of money out. So the the wood pulps, the better brands of the wood pulps, some of which I've shown you, the 230, 200 pound weights are in a block and they really do work very well and they don't cost you the earth that you can keep you can keep practicing but when you start coming down to these cheaper brands of, of paper you know they really will not do uh, a lot of good for you and they'll cause you probably to end up not wanting to paint because you you know you you think you're the problem you think you can't paint properly when sometimes it's the materials, sometimes it's the quality of the paint you're using. Very often it's the quality of the paper and the way you're applying the paper and you're using the paper that will hold you back. But you infer that holding back, that inadequacy, you infer on your, upon yourself and therefore you cause frustration to yourself. And you don't need to. You can alleviate some of these issues by trying to buy a little bit better than you ordinarily may go out and get. So let's. this has gone a little bit of cotton, and I can, it's very hard to show you, but you can see the dampness on the surface. Now this is because there is an awful lot of sizing, surface sizing. I would venture to suggest there's not an awful lot of internal sizing. So there's a lot of surface sizing, is a lot of shine still on here, other areas are drying off a little bit but there is a wave but there is a wave yes but the wave is not like this one was a few minutes ago when it was sitting on the table like this so there is a wave but because i've restricted the amount of that wave then my um painting is going to um not create this or this but you can see how the the paper is just it doesn't work that well to be quite honest with you um i will be really uptight painting on this because i think two things about this that the pattern is completely mechanical um it's it's like engrais mount board but it the paint just doesn't work in the same way now it's going through the sizing here. You can see where it's spread further, but now it's going through. It's absorbing and leaving a hard line. So, okay, well, I think I've proven that point. Now I will still use this method of um, taping down. Or well, one thing I will say, when you've got a tape joint, so I'll put that back down very, very quickly if I can. When you've got a tape joint like this, when you do an excessive wash, you see me often putting a little bit of tape across this corner, not across and making a soft edge, right across there. And just, it doesn't have to be a big piece, just a small piece of tape will do the job, something like that, just across there. 
And what happens, this all wet, so it's not going to stick down. But what happens, that tends to lock the joint off and stop any bleed of uh, water or color coming through the whole painting and into this area and wrecking it for you. But hopefully now you can see that if I leave this, I bet you this now, because there's nothing holding, it's just going to go all over the show and create a real big buckle. Okay, so before we finish this little area of how you hold your paper down, the one area that I haven't spoken about and uh, a lot of people do do, and that is stretching your watercolor paper. Now, it's the old tried and trusted method. Uh, it involves uh, water, a piece of board, your watercolor paper, and quite a bit of this stuff, uh, gummed paper. Now, the thing about that is that it's the very, very best way of having a real tight piece of watercolor, whether it be 140 pound or even 300 pound, you can have a real tight piece of watercolor because you stretched it when it's damp or wet. And once that tape pulls back and the paper fibers constrict again, it's tighter than a drum. And it will then paint. Sometimes it can still ripple a bit, but it will then dry back flat. Now it's not too dissimilar to painting on a block and it is considerably more involved than just picking up a watercolor block and painting with it. But the advantages also are there that it is totally, totally, without exception, the best way to have a piece of tight watercolor paper that will dry back flat and it's not a problem for you. Now, the thing is that it isn't without being involved. You need a piece of board, uh, normally a nice piece of half inch ply, which is strong enough to resist warping. Don't please use MDF. It will buckle and bow as soon as you show it a bit of water. Uh, but use good quality um, birch ply or ply. Three, uh, half an inch is ideal. And just be don't do what I did. Cut some up, use it, and end up full of splinters. Sand the edges down. That really does come back to bite you if you don't do that. Anyway, that all said and done is to then uh, uh, dampen off your paper. I will show you how to do that in another video. Um, dampen it off, apply the tape, and you wet the gum side of this tape. You attach it 50-50 in the same way as I did this, half on, half off, and let that dry up. And once that's done, you can paint on it, and that's fantastic. Now, the thing is that if you wanted to go out on the fly, and do some paintings taking several boards with you is not practical and the time involved in doing it and allowing it to dry properly to work on is at least 24 hours on a good day um, so it's not something that you can just suddenly decide i want to do a watercolor painting and off you go it's if you say tomorrow i'm going to do some watercolor painting and you get prepared today you'd be laughing. But in the in the you know the other option is of course to use a block and that would be my first port of call. I seldom, if I'm honest with you, uh stretch any papers these days because I use 300 pound, which I use masking tape for, and I use block paper when I'm out planting plein air or the, the heavier paper. One quick tip on when it comes to taping down your paper with a um masking tape try and buy yourself a low tack version and there are plenty out there and even then once you've taken some off is just put some of your clothing lint onto it so that it takes a little bit of the tackiness out it will still do its job but when you come to take it off your paper there's little chance of it ripping into the surface of the paper and that can happen happens to me often if i don't take enough care Okay, and a final note on watercolor paper, certainly from this video's point of view, is even if you end up with a piece of paper that's dried and it's all misshapen, as you can see from this one, which is rapidly getting that way, you're still uh, able to redeem it and come up with something that you can salvage. And if you simply take a nice piece of jersey cloth or something underneath, um and turn your paper over on it and then put a t-shirt or something similar over the top a gentle iron i do stress a gentle iron over the top a few times will help that then flatten this piece of paper out i do have recollections from my past where people used to do this with brown packing uh, paper 
the, something coming through the post as a parcel and it could be ironed out and then refolded, reused uh, another time. I do remember that sort of thrift going on and using that same principle you can flatten out an image and get it back to a point where you can then put it into a mount and get it framed up and it will look very very nice. Okay, so that sums up for this video all about watercolour paper. Now, I know it's not been a short video and a lot of it has just been me gassing away to you guys and giving you hints and tips, but I do hope that what I put into it has been useful. And there are a lot more things that one can talk about when it comes to watercolour paper. Just saying very quickly that every type of watercolour paper out there, professional, amateur, cheap and nasty, they are all... All their patterns, all their forms between rough and not are always going to be different. The way that they're made by the individual company will be different. Even the colours of the paper can alter from uh, a creamy colour, a buffy colour, to a pure and a brilliant white, depending on the amount of um, whitening or, or, or bleaching that goes into the fibres to make it whiter. So, you know it's worth looking around it really is worth shopping around seeing what best suits both you your pocket the surface you like to work on but i would try and steer you towards the more uh quality that you can afford the better your effect or the better chances of you coming out with a watercolor paper that you really do appreciate really have enjoyed making i am so sorry that it's gone so long uh, I didn't realize how much I can yabber on about watercolor paper for and there is so much more to consider so get out there do some investigating have a bit of fun with some painting I catch each and every one of you in the next video I will next week be doing a, another plein air I am planning to go out for a night in the new van for those who are following my uh, artist and van uh, episodes so that is going to be interesting next week because I am going to be out in the van for the first time spending a night overnight somewhere and painting each side of that and filming that experience. So I hope it goes well and uh, you'll see that in next week or the week after's video. So watch out for that. In the meantime, stay safe, happy painting, have lots of fun, be creative. Catch you all soon. Bye bye. Felt the storm coming fast, it broke the wall. Scattered glass across the floor. I know this is the final war. There's no use trying to pretend, there's no way to comprehend. No way back, no way to mend. This means we have to end. Take your brokenness and go. You're not welcome anymore. There's no forgiveness in.